Chapter 6 Captain Sampson and Norman Gall discussed the fate of Ethan over a pint in the whimpering tavern located in Dress, a village underlooking the grassy mountains of the highlands of Ilther, Sampson's homeland. Sampson wants to give Norman the title of knight in his hometown, but Norman respectfully declines. He is not one for publicity if he can help it. Captain Sampson was originally a barbarian of the Highlands from the Battle Branded tribe. They travel with the feral priests and gypsies in the Highlands, which cover all of the north part of the world that isn't in snow. Snow, however, does fall rarely on the Highlands. Sampson uses two weapons and a shield, is a master at arms, a hunter, has a boisterous voice, and knows how to speak gypsy. He rarely uses it, uses it but it does come in handy. He has often seen carving through his rough, unkept mutton chops with a dagger. Just as Samson glimpses out the dirty brown window, some places not even see through, a group of four sh shadow priests of Murek travel by very slowly on horseback, their heads still but eyes ever glancing everywhere, as if searching for something or someone. Shadow priests are more accurately called the monks of the shadow, as they don't actively convert others into their beliefs and do not draw power from any outside source or god. They are the most powerful order of priests and are feared and respected all over the world as mock necromancers. As they ride through, many onlookers gasp in awe, some frozen in fear. Norman and Samson open the window to view the passing priests on white spotted horses. One of the priests sees Norman and issues his hand up quickly to the others, halting them on their horses. As they stay in their spot, the lone priest rides up to the low-hanging window sill and sticks out a folded note tied with thin rope string. As Norman looks down at it, the priest says, I am Cassius. These are my friends. Do not trouble yourself with them. We have unofficial yet important business from the wizard lord of Hypos concerning the witch hunter named Norman Gall. Is that you? Norman replies, Yes, I am he. This is captain of that town's guard ship, Creon Sampson. Is he part of this so-called unofficial business as well? Sampson puffs up and yells, I can speak for myself, Norman, thank you very much. Who are you? What is going on in High Post? Shadow Priest Cassius then replies, Nothing of note. We were simply paid to deliver this message to the one named Norman Gall. If that really is you, then will you please take this note from Darkin and let us be on our way back to Murek? We are simply passing by. Samson turns away, grabs the tankard of brandy from his table, and looks up and says with a low brow, With all due respect, I think we should let King Hevar know that Darkin wants to meet with you. The wiz that wizard is up to no damn good, I say. Norman looks down and says, I, I think I agree. If I am not mistaken, he is affiliated with the enslavers, and formerly with Ebony Tower. Good that, the good thing that place is just a tomb now. Deserve what it got. The priests that are waiting on the courier snicker Lally and, and, and Cassius lets out a half laugh and says, "Right then, okay, we're off, fellows. Back to sanctuary." They start to ride again, but do not change any distance from one another. The courier gives two, a two-finger salutation from the side of his forehead and says, The shadow will rise again, Norman Gall. Norman and Samson stare at them as they pick up speed and eventually mush off into the distance of the dusk. The two will head back to High Post in the morning, a half-day trip. Norman is now filthy rich and can afford to buy them both the best inns and the best beds in the town, both in different inns. The best inns in town, the ones on the outlying river in the field. Before bed, Norman opens his note, the string popping off into the floor. It reads, Witch Hunter, I am Darkin. I wish to speak with you about your recent victory over the once indomitable Ebony Tower. I await your arrival. Norman folds it up and sets it in his pack, then stares up at the flickering lights on the ceiling from the lanterns and movement of people walking through the lit single hallway outside. Tomorrow a new adventure begins. Darkin sits on his throne, in his throne room, a throne of old waxy bones, the top adorned with three skulls. 
He gets up and paces back and forth and notices a figure stepping from the front door of the highest most room. Dannon. Darkin then lets out a sigh. I was not expecting you so soon. The witch hunter is reportedly on his way now from dress. The man looks at Darkin and asks, Couldn't you simply teleport him here? It would be quicker that way, but silence fills the room. Darkin responds quickly. The shadow priest would have my head if I teleported anyone here. It is not an option. Darkin stops pacing and sits on his throne, pulling Lancaster's stolen staff from the wall over to his right hand through the air telekinetically. Keep your friends close, but your enemies closer, I always say, Darkin says subtly. From the drafty stone door in walks Lancaster from outside. Where is my staff? he asks Darkin, the dark wizard. Lancaster spots it and in a moment's notice snatches it through the air from Darkin's very hand. The mysterious Denon holds his hand out from his sides in a blob of black shadow and eyes move about within the very floor itself. This is my fight, Denon, utters Darkin, but Darkin stops in midway and says, Don't you dare. He reaches behind the throne and grabs his staff and wipes it off. Lancaster notices this. Darkin, who looks somewhat young and middle-aged, with a jet black robe and a silver diamond on the collar, now puts his hands and arms behind him and walks slowly toward Lancaster. Then his eyes widen and he sends forth a foul energy in all directions to the walls and ceiling, leaving the floor untouched. From it issues fire lashes that whip Lancaster. and make him bleed in very tiny cuts and nicks. Lancaster runs around trying to avoid them, but they are everywhere. Lancaster erects a shield of shimmering green like water and oil, nullifying the whips. Lancaster hears water running through the thick stone walls and assumes Darkin has countermeasures against this attack and uses it as his bread and butter. Darkin then holds out a clawed hand and opens his fingers and the entire tower explodes with fire and black orbs of smoke, the orbs honing into Lancaster as he maneuvers, but the fireballs and streams of heat coming to assume locations. The attack is vast and powerful and there is no escape. With imminent doom closing in fast as the dry tower becomes an oven, Lancaster notices there is no smoke from all of this, so it is magical. The inferno gets wild and seems to be closing in on Lancaster, and his shield is, and his shield will not hold. So, in one last desperate attempt, he throws his staff and it explodes, sending a subtle light all about the tower and his person. A thick cold mist fills the tower fast, and the fire gets frozen to the walls and ceiling. In the center of all this is the frozen statue of a man. Lancaster frozen completely into ice. The unusually uh, impatient Darkin feels he should not take any chances, and in a moment's time, just as the mist makes it visible enough to see Lancaster, he shatters him with his telekinesis, and the ice man explodes into small and large chunks all over the floor. Some of the, some of the, inside already partially water. Denon has already fled, and just as a smile came to Tarkin's face, he looks up remembering the explosion which used causing heat energy, his forte, and prepares for the water to come down. It is too late. Lancaster's plan worked, and now a very concentrated magic dissolving water called Drismia, the opposite of ethereal ink, which amplifies and contains and manipulates magic, is falling all over dark and light rain. And for the first time in 2035 years, Darkin is powerless. The sun then starts to shine a little through Darkin's small, up high window, window holes. As dawn approaches, a blank stare comes over the dark wizard, as over 2,000 years has become forfeit. Denon is Norman's brother. He is a former witch hunter who infiltrated the enslavers and then later joined them instead. He is both a friend and enemy of Darkin more like competition. Dannon and Norman were separated at birth and never knew one another. Norman's mother told him he had a long lost brother but Dannon was never told of Norman. The fact that they both became witch hunters is strange. 
Burval Sampson to a barmaid at the Country Inn and dress. You are a comely wench. Let us go to my bedchambers and have some fun. Come on. I insist. Yells Sampson to the beautiful, natural, complected looking woman. Maybe later, sir. I am working right now, says the woman as she rags the table down. Sampson immediately smacks her on her right cheek and celebrates, saying, Good enough for me, honey. The woman's. F the woman. F the woman. F the woman furiously clocks him over the forehead with the bottom edge of a tankard, and he falls through his chair onto the ground and passes out, mostly from being drunk. Before all this, earlier that day, Norman decided to go it alone to High Post. He was about there, just passing through the city of Silverstone, when an airy distant voice speaks to him and says, Norman, I am being held in a sketty at the Tempest Kill for using forbidden magic. I escaped Darken. You must go there now. He stole my staff and corrupted it, and I was forced to extinguish, extinguish it to cause a huge diversion, and then I teleported here to Escadia. They are very strict about the law here. Every priesthood peers into the Tempest of Magic to monitor its uses in the world, but I figured Escadia would adhere to reason. I was wrong. Do not speak, simply listen. Gather Samson and try to get me out of this prison. I am being held at the Tempest Guild, Norman. Norman affirmed that message riding on horseback slowly this time, and nodded. Meanwhile in Murat, the shadow priests were watching the fight between Lancaster and Darkin by peering into the tempest, using a massive ceremonial bowl and ethereal ink full to the brim the whole time, as Darkin had told them to see Lancaster's strengths and weaknesses and report to the remnants of the Ebony Tower.